Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey, the Bulletproof Executive with Bulletproof Executive Radio. Oh wait, uh, that's kind of kind of a creative name I came up with there. Uh, but oh well, let's keep going. Today's guest is kind of interesting because she's going to tell us what would you do if an ice cream truck showed up outside your door and you were told to get inside and scream as part of a team building exercise. Uh, <laughs> Stella Grisant is the founder and CEO of WUPA, and she's going to answer that question for us. But first, I want to say thanks. Uh, we just made number one on iTunes. Woo-hoo! I'm really stoked. We've had more than 3 million downloads, and I'm just grateful for all the support. So if you like this show, please click like on iTunes and just let other people know that we're creating some awesome content. Stella, who you just heard in the background there, is the CEO and founder of WUPA, and she makes happiness and well-being learning programs for businesses, including like Columbia University, City of New York. And she's had like a really good career coaching 100 or 1,200 women entrepreneurs and having national impact on happiness, which is really kind of cool. So we talk about butter and coffee and stuff like that a lot. But I wanted to have Stella on to talk about A, women and B, happiness. And so Stella, welcome to the show. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. So happy to be on. Thank you. Is it true that you have a master's in applied positive psychology from UPenn? (laughs) It is true. It is. It is true. People are like, what? You got a master's in the science of happiness? And I'm like, yes, I do. Isn't it the most awesome thing? Because what what more fun thing could you study? Like, you know, happiness. That's just, you know, that's just fun. I went to UPenn. I I went to Wharton. and uh, yes. The problem is I study negative psychology, so I, I'm not sure. No, I, <laughs> it, what's the difference between psychology and positive psychology in a degree? I'm, I'm actually kind of curious about that. So really good question. That's what I get all the time. They're like positive psychology as opposed to negative psychology. And actually, kind of, yes. Um, so psychology to date, which is only about a 100 or so year science, is an empirical investigation of what's wrong with people and how do we fix it? So it takes, you know, people from negative 10 to zero and think like it's come up with all sorts of great um, diagnoses and solutions um, for mental illness, for problems. Um, But positive psychology asks the question, what's right with people and how do we amplify it? What's, what makes life worth living and how do we, how do we create positive interventions to help people really get from zero to plus 10. Matt, that was uh, elegantly stated. I imagine you've said that before. <laughs> I have said that several times. <laughs> so I, I love that line of thinking because I almost wanted to say, what do you mean what's wrong with people? Like there generally isn't that much wrong with you. The fact that you're not doing as well as you could do doesn't mean there's anything wrong. And it, it has to do with, with how you see yourself and how you see the world and changing your, your mindset is cool. But I did not know until we started um, checking you out to see, you know, to qualify you to be on the show that like, oh, positive psychology as a degree is, is kind of cool. Why did you decide to be one of the first 150 people to get this degree? Like, it's, it's kind of like, I'm going to have a career in positive psychology. <laughs> like, corporations are hiring. I'm going to get a job. What, what was the deal there? Why? It's, it's just like, it's what I was meant to do. I mean, I was like, the go-to friend who everyone would go, you know, ask like love advice or what should I do, you know, to get a promotion or like how do I deal with this problem? I mean, ever since like, you know, being 10 on the playground, that was just so evident and I loved helping people. And when I stumbled across this degree, I just thought, oh my God, this is it. Like I have to, I have to go for it. So, um, yeah, it was, it was definitely something I just thought that's for me. But it's awesome that you, uh, you figured that out. I like the, the month I was graduating from my undergrad, my, my six year or four year degree, uh, I got a degree in information systems and I, I was like, wait, they have something called cognitive studies. That's the coolest thing ever. Like I totally want to do that, but it was too late. So I went off and got a job and, you know, started companies and stuff like that. But, uh, kudos to you for figuring out a degree that you felt was your calling and and you went for it and you've taken that amplified the message pretty well for entrepreneurs, which is another thing we have in common. We, we both work on that, Yeah. but I want to talk about like 
okay, what do you learn in this program? What have you learned in, in your practice? Like, why is it important to focus on increasing your well-being? Like, what do you get out of it? Uh, good question. So the first thing that, um, that I guess big, big macro tech t- takeaways is, one, we learned that happiness is really powerful, right? So um, having, a, having amplified positive emotions um, has proven to extend your life. So there is a study that, um, that followed older men um, over the age of 65 for two years. And what they found after two years is that the men who reported being happier were twice as likely to be alive than those who weren't. Um, and there's also, this has been replicated in a lot of different ways. So one, it, positivity just lengthens your life, which is pretty awesome. Um, it heightens your immunity. I don't, I'm sure you've heard of the study where they like, um, they put people into a hotel and they quarantined them and they gave everyone like the common cold and injected them with the cold. And then that that was my last job. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, so every, so you're making people sick for a week and then you measure their snot and you measure their symptoms. And what they found is that people who, you know, came in with a more positive mindset, um, experienced fewer symptoms. Um, and there's a whole load of great, like, bio awesome benefits for positivity. On a professional front, you know, we find that people are 30 to 50 percent more productive at work. They're three times more creative because they literally see more. There's a really cool study, which is one of my favorite, where they had people hooked up to eye tracking devices. And I know you're you're, you've done all yeah, sorts I, of interesting stuff. I'm going studies. right here. Can you see? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. So, um, so they hooked people up to eye tracking devices, and they they simulated a negative experience, or they sh- they showed them all sorts of negative, sad, depressing movies, and then they showed another group all sorts of happy, uplifting movies and images. And what they found is when they watched where uh, they what they found is that the participants who were in in a negative mood, they found that their eyes, when looking at a picture, tended to stay in the center and just stay in one particular area. Whereas the people who were in a positive mood, their eyes tended to first go around the periphery of the image and then kind of all over inside. So literally you see the big picture, your, your, your vision literally and figuratively is affected when you're experiencing more positivity. Um, and and it also makes you look hotter, which I know is also very important to your to your readers. I, I've been working on it, but my experiments <laughs> keep failing utterly. I, I don't know what's going on there, but I'll tell you when I get that one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's found that like you know when people see an authentic smile, and I mean people really can sense their energy and where we're at. And when you're not in a good mood, people kind of want to stay away from you. Um, they don't really you know want to be in in connection with you whereas then if you're a positive mood or you're happy um that draws people in and we know from mirror neurons that also people begin to actually feel your positivity and mimic it and you know goodness from there so so I, all right, I, I gotta yeah. challenge you a little bit there yes please so people can uh, you know, can sense your energy. All right, so you've got a degree in positive psychology, so you're already like not a real scientist. No, I'm just, I don't believe that, but that's like the stereotype, right? So, okay, okay. How do we know people can sense each other's energy? Like, like, do you actually study that? Like, are there experiments? Like, how does all that work? Yeah. So, well, when it comes to negative emotion, um, we can. There's. There's things that we can see that we're not always conscious of. So, for example, there's. Um, there's a study, I'm not, it's not coming to the top of mind in terms of who did this study, um, but what they did is they had people, um, again, watch sad movies, and then they had someone come into the laboratory and observe that person, and then they had someone co- watch happy movies and be in a positive mood and observe that person. And what they would find is that the person who was observing the person who was experiencing the mood shifts would report that person as more likable 
they would report that person as someone who's more attractive or less attractive. So in, in that respect, you can observe certain things and how they observe them. There's, there are studies about electromagnetic fields. I'm not an expert on that at all. Do, do you think I, they're real or is that BS? I'm, I gotta know. Um, do I think they're real? Absolutely. Yeah. Because oh. yeah, I, I, I just do. Okay. I, mean, I, yeah. I do too. I, I've seen some of the studies. I know some of the guys who do the research, uh, yeah. heart math Institute and, I mean, heck, I, I think you can actually control that stuff. So, all right, I, I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that, so kind of what I was trying to, to say first is that what I learned is that happiness in, is important. But the other thing that I learned is happiness is not enough. Yeah. And that's where, um, you know, the conversation about well-being takes over. So um, the problem with a lot of, especially in America, is that we think we're always supposed to be happy and that happiness is like the destination and that we should all strive to be happy. Um, and yeah, being happy is really awesome. But the problem with happiness is that it's transient. It's based on emotions, which never stay around. They're always kind of fluid and moving. Um, and the other problem with happiness is that, you know, if all we cared about was being happy, we probably would never have children. We probably would never take care of the elderly. And we probably wouldn't take classes or do experiences that may challenge us into like extreme discomfort, but that might end up helping us grow in pretty phenomenal ways. So you look like you're going to say something. Uh, I was sorry. I, I didn't realize you were going to go. I was yeah, they, they call that the, the land of the, the lotus eaters, you know, in whatever book that is. But, you know, p p I think that's uh, Gulliver's Travels, right? But the, the idea of it, you know, people who are like, oh, we're happy all the time. And, mm -hmm. and you've probably seen that in your favorite yoga teacher. Uh, you, you know, like they're a couple minutes late to yoga class and they're like super happy, but mm -hmm. like they're kind of getting by. And by the way, I've done yoga for a long time. I love mm -hmm. yoga teachers. Yeah. But, you can be so far on the happiness spectrum that you know you're maybe not addressing other things that you needed to do. Totally, okay, I, I hear what you're saying there. Totally, and you you just want to account for other things like when you're not t necessarily feeling off the charts positive. There's other things going on in your life that you want to consider, such as your relationships, yeah. your sense of meaning to something bigger than yourself, your engagement in your work, your sense of accomplishment. So those are all things that we track when we think about well-being and positive psychology. And um, yeah, so paying attention to those things, I think, in addition to your general positivity is kind of gets you to kind of where you want to be versus just think, just observing your emotions. What is the role of status in happiness? Because like we talk about mm -hmm. being happy, but you know, there's the happy guy living under the bridge. Uh, and mm -hmm. maybe he's genuinely happy and it's totally yeah. possible. And, and there's yeah. guys like Richard Dawkins who've like achieved enlightenment allegedly, um, yeah. you know, while living in a park. Um, but there's also like, you know, guys who have everything or, you know, uh, you know, social figures and, and people who are just so well respected, you know, Oprah Winfrey or something like that. Yeah. What is the, the spectrum between like economically having it or just socially having the status and not having it? How does that affect our happiness and as well as just our positivity? Um, so by status, do you mean automatically, well, do you, right, is that with wealth or? Well, there's socioeconomic status, right? So you yeah. can have a lot of influence and not a lot of money. You can have a lot yeah. of money, not a lot of influence, but people uh -huh. generally have enough money and a lot of influence. I don't know what to call okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> we so, could separate them out if you want. Okay. We just talk about status and, and wealth independently. Is it, is that a good yeah. question that way? Well, I guess, I mean, if I was to bring in some studies, there's some studies that talk about each of those things separately okay. and then. I can just comment, but like, so there is some research on does money buy you happiness? And what we found is that up to a certain point it does. And um, that's about, the last I looked, it was $66,000, which is just enough kind of to, to keep your basic needs met. So home in certain parts of the country. Um, but basically that implies once you have kind of the basic necessities in life, um, increasing income doesn't necessarily mean increase in happiness. Um, so sure, it will buy you maybe a better yoga class, um, but you still have to go to the yoga class and embody the lessons of the yoga class. It's not going to get you into that kind of 
level of peacefulness. It's not going to bring you that peacefulness. Okay, so um, in in, yeah. in the Bay Area, like in San Francisco, yeah. you need sixty six thousand dollars a month to be happy. But like, what about the rest of the country? <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if that works in the Bay Area. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. And that was per month, not per year. But <laughs> all right, so so sixty six k on an average thing. Yeah. And above that, what happens? Okay, so you make seventy six thousand. That extra ten thousand doesn't move the positivity or the happiness needle at all. Um, well, what what the research says is that it doesn't get you the it doesn't continue um, to grow at the same level as your income. So maybe you continue to get a little incrementally more happy. Maybe you go on more vacations. Um, you have you can spend more time with your friends, but um, it doesn't it doesn't move one for one with your increase in wealth. Okay, so you get one positive point for every dollar up to 66,000. <laughs> Above that, you only get, you know, half a positive point for every dollar and you've, and it gets smaller with time and it drops off. Okay. Yeah, so I don't I don't know the numbers exactly, but yeah, that's the gist. Um but when it comes to status, it's interesting because there's um there's some interesting research on control and when you have a lot of status and control, um, you tend to be doing a lot better than the people who feel they don't have control. In fact, people who feel like they don't have control and influence actually live shorter lives. So I would imagine that status does bring you a level of um, kind of life satisfaction because you feel like you have a lot of control. Um, but I, I don't know if it necessarily gives you like all the other things like, you know, really rich, nurturing relationships or a sense of meaning and purpose. Um, yeah, or you can't, you can't buy that. You just have to rent it. And it <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> so <laughs> that's a good side business. <laughs> <laughs> well, well let, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, it, it's a good joke, right? But, but the idea that you said earlier, happiness is fleeting. Uh, yeah. So like, okay, you, you can have some happiness, but whether or not you're making 66,000 or 46 or 86, whatever. Um, yeah. Like, okay, what percentage of time should you be positive? Because, you know, are you going to have positive without negative? How would you even know you're positive? Like, what's yeah. the ratio I should be targeting? Yeah. So, um, so there's a general rule of thumb uh, in positive psychology um, that you want to – okay, so let me just back up a second. So first, let's start with kind of um, this idea of a negativity bias, which you're familiar with, um, right? Sure, but let, so, let's assume let's, someone listening in their car isn't, so run us through exactly. it. Exactly. So um, negativity bias essentially says that our brains have a natural instinct to pay attention to anything that's bad, negative, or threatening. Um, that's just where our attention goes first. And even in our... Um, even in our memory recall, it's much easier for us to retrieve memories that are negative than those that are positive. So we have this bias towards the negative. Now, because it's so strong, in order for us to actually um, live life not like a zero-sum game, but like a positive, have a positive experience, we want to almost overcompensate with the positive emotions. So the general rule of thumb is that you want to experience three times the amount of positivity for one, for one experience of negativity or negative emotions. And, hmm. and um, so, but what I want to underscore is that negative emotions aren't bad. Yeah. You just want to keep them in check. Um, that's kind of another kind of problem that people think with like positive psychology or happiness. It's like all yellow smiles. No, it's not like yellow smiley face. It's actually just kind of learning the skills to flourish within a life experience where, you know, shit hits the fan. So, yeah. A lot of people would argue that, okay, you want to be happy three quarters of the time but they don't necessarily feel in control of their happiness. Like, okay, I went on four dates, you know, three bad yeah. ones, I was unhappy, and one good one, I was happy, right? Yeah. Something like that, but, you know, how was, you know, how am I to know what the date's gonna be like, because, you know, I just met them on some dating site, or whatever, but, like, yeah. how do you control whether you have happiness three quarters of the time or not? Good question. Well, I think, well, I bring everything back to attention, and I, I, I describe 
your life experience as like being in the director's seat and you get to point the camera wherever you want to create, you know, the movie that you want. So we could have like a scene and have three different directors create three different movies just based on where they point the camera. They tell different stories. And so I believe that everything just comes down to where you point your attention. So if you have four bad dates, three bad dates, one good date, you know, well, you can focus your attention on what did you learn about yourself in each of those dates that's helping you clarify your ideal partner. Because had you maybe not had those dates, you might have not realized you had certain needs. Um, or maybe you learned how to be, you know, great at breaking up, which is like a good skill, you know, like I, there's, I'm sure there's things to appreciate about, you know, the negative stuff. That, um, that sounds like a practice of gratitude, frankly. Yeah. I mean, that is a practice of gratitude for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I'm hearing there then is in order to be happy, you should practice gratitude. Am I putting... Am I putting words in your mouth or is that no, kind of... Not, not at all. That all is right. definitely one thing you want to practice for sure. I think I see gratitude as like the gateway emotion. Yeah. And, and you know, if you, if you practice enough gratitude, you know, it kind of opens you up on the continuum of positivity. Um, and it's just an easier thing to access because, grat you know, it, gratitude is easier sometimes for people than like, you know, love or um, peace or um, wonder. So gratitude's a nice one to kind of get in the flow. Got it. So when that happens, then other more positive emotions happen that are maybe harder to access for the average person. How, how much control do we really have over our emotional state? Awesome question. So we actually, um, there's, there's a formula that researchers have found that when it comes to having control over our happiness, that 10% of our happiness is just based on life circumstances which are out of our control. So we can't control the fact that we were born to certain parents or we were born in a certain time or a certain country. Um, so those things we can't control, that's 10%. 40% ac is accounted for um, our genetics, which although I know you've been um, sharing some really cool information on how we can control what DNA is expressed, and we do talk about that a little bit um, in my class about love and fear, but for the most part, we have a general set point when it comes to our personalities, and that's just genetic. And again, some people are just born um, a little bit more grumpy, some are born a little bit more effervescent, and that they have a set point, and they can move the needle. So that's um, that's 50%. So the remaining 40% is where we do have control in our happiness. And that 40% is based on what we actually do, the choices that we make, the place where we point the camera. And, um, and so that's the place where we get to work and play um, on a daily basis and practice, you know, hopefully having a good outcome. So, so you are a, a believer in the set point theory of happiness. And, and it's as a genetic determinant. Um, I am a believer that that is we we do come in with a certain disposition. Yes. Can it be changed? I believe it can be changed. Yeah. So, so you can move your set point. Cool. I yeah. I was hoping you would say that. If not, yeah. I was gonna have a interesting question with you. <laughs> I mean, I I changed my Myers Briggs type with neurofeedback, for instance. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of mindfulness and awareness practices over time will even you out and take, you know, you, you can just move from one part to the other. And oh, what yeah. appears to be set maybe isn't set if you can dig deep enough. Uh, you know, that, that said, you know, if you have a deficiency in manufacturing a neurotransmitter, you might just tend towards a certain direction and that's just how yeah. it's going to be. Yeah. I, I definitely believe you can do so much transformational work and absolutely, um, what did you, did you intentionally with your Myers-Briggs say, I want to change this into this? 
No, I just did it, and then I yeah. did a you know bunch of personal growth stuff. Yeah. Uh, my three hundred thousand dollars of biohacking and yeah. lots, lots of different things. And uh, I happened to notice when I did it at a corporate event later. I'm like, wow, it doesn't really look kind of the uh -huh. same. Yeah. But you know, a lot of the, the attitudes that come in towards you know, being judgmental or analytical. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I tended to score pretty high on those, and I actually not remembering my current type. But what I uh, what I found was that I tended to be very near the middle on almost everything when, when I was done. So I was, you know, almost like flexible to move from this side to that That's side, cool. uh, which yeah. has been really beneficial. I, yeah. I think it's helped me put myself in other people's shoes. And, and even yeah. when I do public speaking or hosting the show or writing a blog post, yeah. I find it's really easy to to go between the two sides. There are the four directions sort of and, and try and use language that isn't going to set off. Uh, yeah. any one side and you sort of cut a quarter or half the audience from hearing yeah. the message so they can at right. least access it and then totally you know and then make a decision as to whether they want to use it or throw it away or whatever else but if i can't get past like the built-in filters yes it seems like people don't even like have a chance to read it right that's awesome so all right let's say that I'm feeling really sad because I just got rejected. You know, I asked for a raise. My boss said no. I asked, yeah. you know, the the pretty girl out on a date, <laughs> and she said no. And she said not only no, but you know, I wouldn't date your brother. And, you know, whatever else, right? So you're having a really bombed out day, and you yeah. know, you get in a car accident, right? So you're experiencing oh, okay. a lot of painful emotion. Knock on wood. <laughs> what do you do, right? You know, so it's it's just been a shitty day. Pardon the phrase, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. To, to walk me through what what to do about that. I want to be one of those 75, 25 happy people. <laughs> um, well, where I always like to start is with where you are. So I think it's really important to just be present for, you know, how are you feeling right now? I think um, it's so, so many people want to um, distract themselves from that feeling of shittiness um, because it's just, it doesn't feel good. So we want to distract ourselves. Maybe we like have a drink or we go shopping or we just work really hard or we go on the internet. Um, but what you want to do is kind of just recognize, wow, I'm having a really shitty day. And sometimes it actually helps by labeling it out loud. There was an interesting study that found that when MRI patients were about to go into the tube thing, um, mm -hmm when the operators would ask them how they were feeling and they actually s stated, um, you know, that they were feeling nervous, they found that their kind of um, anxiety went down faster than with other participants. So, and I also found that to be true, you know, I find that to be true f for myself and, you know, clients that I work with as well. If you're just kind of open with where you are. Um, and, and that also you know, for outside of your shitty day example, if even if you're working with a group of people or you're a manager, um, if you can start with where you are, then you kind of let down the resistance because people, again, will pro if they know you well, can probably sense that something's up. So by stating it, you kind of allow yourself to relax and be taken into context. And um, that really helps move things along. So anyway, I'd label it. That's the first thing okay. I'd do. Um, and then um, uh, there's a few few interventions that have been studied that, that work. Um, one intervention that has been proven, I, um, I guess sometimes I do it, um, is fake it. So... What they found is that it's the pen study that you put in your mouth. Um, so they had people like put a pen in their mouth like this. Uh -huh. And so it's kind of like a fake smile. <laughs> and then they had people put the pen in their mouth like this. Right. You can't smile. So what they found is when they showed them comics afterwards that the people who were like this actually uh -huh. found the comics more funny. So there is something to say about faking it, but you have to internally want to fake it. Um, it has to start intrinsically. So for me, if I'm in a really bad mood, if I get dressed, put on my makeup, go to see a friend or something, um, generally that, that can help. Um, uh, the other thing 
that I've uh, that I've created for people, <laughs> for myself actually. Um, you start. You mentioned the ice cream truck. Um, yeah. I was meaning to ask you about that. <laughs> uh, so I was having a really shitty day one day, um, and I uh, my boyfriend now husband just moved into my four hundred square foot studio in Manhattan which also was my office at the time. Wow. And his, like, you know, socks were in places. There were, like, cords everywhere. And, like, my minimalist apartment suddenly was, like, ah, chaos. Um, And there was just a lot going on in my business and my life. And somehow it all just came into that moment where I was feeling so overwhelmed, all I wanted to do was scream. Now, you're in a Manhattan apartment. There's neighbors everywhere. There's buildings stacked next to each other. If you scream, like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking people are going to think I'm crazy. They're going to call the cops. God knows what's going to happen. But then part of me actually um, paused. And that's when, you know, and if you have a meditation practice, you can pause and kind of watch your thoughts. And part of me paused and was like, don't hold this back and then just hop over it and keep going. See what happens if you go through this emotion. And so I decided to just let myself scream and beat some pillows. And afterwards, I felt like giddy and light. And it was like, you know, better than sex. It was just so good. It was such a weight off my chest. And um, for me, what that moment was, was just embodying what I was feeling, so acknowledging what I was feeling and moving through it. And so um, so I created a truck to help people do just that more often. But, yeah, so whatever you can do to... So this um, is a truck you go into and scream? Yes. And is it, like, per minute? Like, how do you charge for this? Um, well, organizations <laughs> hire <I'm just> us. <laughs> but mostly if I go out into the community, I do it for free. Just like I just let people come in and experience it. It's not, um, it's not, it's like 5% screaming and like 95% relaxation and embodiment work. Are, are um, they like hitting things with sticks too? They kind of are. Oh, okay. Foam noodles. <laughs> all right, all right. I, I did something like that once and, um, I, it, it felt absurd it was like this multi-day personal growth retreat and yeah. pe- it, it was really profound i watched people snap like there's this one grandmother there and and she's like you know kind of standing there like screaming and all of a sudden like she really got into it and just like demolished of her foam yeah. noodle <laughs> i'm like wow that was one angry woman she didn't yeah. look that angry yeah. um and it took me like three days to be like actually like scream and mean it yeah. so it was it was definitely not a rational activity in any way, shape, or form, but it yeah. works. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, the way I set it up is that it's a playful activity. I don't set it up as kind of, um, you know, uh, primal therapy at all. It's it's more just like it's a way for you to play with what you're experiencing right now. And there's an audio experience that guides you through it. There's bright colors. So, so Okay, so you're, you're cultivating <laughs> the observer in it and sort of the sense, a little bit of absurdity and just like being aware. Exactly. Okay, I, I get it. That, that seems like a, a cool approach, maybe more mainstream. That I'm not I'm not into the primal scream kind of thing yeah. at all. It's it's not, not the thing that works for me. I'm, I'm not either. I'm not either. Yeah. So, um, but I think the biggest thing is for you just to, um, be conscious of where you are and, and kind of, um, don't try to rush out of it. Um, just if you could get back into your center, um, breathing, noticing what's good. Okay. So, so we're feeling really bad. We label it. We admit that we're feeling bad. Yeah. So you acknowledge an emotion, then yeah. you um, sort of cultivate an awareness of, of it as, as a part of that. Yeah. Uh, and what's the next step there? Uh, um, you scream, know, it, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really, it's not like a linear approach. Okay. It's hard for me to, like, I wish I could say, here's a five-step process to, you know, unwinding any shitty mood. Um, but it really depends on what's happening for you in the moment. Um I think the the one thing that's a constant is just really being a, with where you are in in that moment, um, and then 
if you can, um, once you acknowledge it and you feel that you want to move towards a more positive state, then I would go towards, you know, gratitude. I would go be with a friend because relationships are actually our number one driver of happiness, even though they may be the cause of the shitty experience. <laughs> um, but uh, people are really important. I think when we're in a negative place, we begin to feel very isolated. And um, being is feeling lonely is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you can bring yourself to be with someone else, if you do something nice for someone else, that's another way to kind of get out of your head. Um, giving and being kind um, actually, you know, stimulates um, our, our dopamine. Some people report actually experiencing a helper's high, um, which means that um, some people, when they're volunteering, if they're volunteering regularly with a level of frequency, um, they report feeling less pain. They report feeling stronger. So, um, so there's a lot of um, and I think the best part of it is that you just forget yourself. If you can just forget yourself and your problems that are in your head um, and focus on kind of the present moment and being of service, that's a nice way to get out of your funkiness as well. Cool. Okay, so so I heard do something nice for someone else. So you're feeling really crappy. You say, ah, I'm feeling really crappy, but you look nice today, right? <laughs> and, and that can break your mood. Yeah. Um, all right. There's a certain number of people who would who would say, "Well, ice cream, ice cream will work." Uh, so, what's your take on the value of food? Is that an emotional eating response? Like, like what's the deal there? Uh, I think everything in perspective. Um, so, so good I, ice cream, you're saying? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, I just think it. I think it really. I think I. I really. I'm. If you wanna. For the most part, people do tend to emotionally eat and escape into it, just like drugs. Um, and and you don't want that to be your go-to to numb your experience. Um, but sometimes it's hard for you to... You can't go from feeling totally shitty to like zippity-doo-dah. You, you might need to take some micro steps. Um, so if you take small steps and if that ice cream is... Uh, I don't want to like say ice cream is okay, but if in that moment of time, if you don't have an eating problem, if you if you can handle, um, you know, treating yourself without overdoing it, then yeah, go ahead, have an ice cream. Just like six scoops, no more. <laughs> Some extra hot fudge. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's a slippery slope. I hear you saying, and you brought up something else. That was my next question. All right, what about pot? Uh, you know, it yeah. raises alpha waves. Alpha waves are, of course, correlated with happiness. Yeah. So, you know, if you're not a daily user and you're like, man, I had a really crappy day, I think I'm going to, you know, hit the bong. Yeah. I just, uh, I don't have much experience in that category, so I can't really say. I've watched a lot of people important in my life uh, use that as their kind of medicine, and I just... I only have a personal opinion about it, which is like, you need to be able to deal in the present moment presently. So if that substance is taking you out of your body and your ability to be right here and now, then I don't think that's supportive. Uh, that that sounds almost like a regular psychologist, not a positive psychologist. <laughs> All right. No, I, I I don't have a particular like I I'm not a post pot. I'm not a huge yeah. I'm not a huge user. Like it, yeah. you know, I, I'll, I'll eat something with pot in it on a rare yeah. occasion at yeah. the right party just because yeah. like, it's fun. Sure. But I can't imagine like oh I'm feeling really bad. I'm gonna have pot. I would yeah. be like give me the coffee. But that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> so all right. What about boredom? This is like a, a more slippery one. It's yeah. one thing to be like you know I was in a car accident and no one likes me. You know I'm yeah. you know and I'm ugly to boot. So okay, that was a really extreme example I asked about. Okay, so now I have the most boring job ever. In fact, I'll tell you a job I used to have. Okay. People don't know this. For five years, yeah. I would pack auto parts in boxes in a oh warehouse. My God. Like at the end of high school when I was in college, like I would pay for my tuition all summer just walking around, pushing a cart. Like it was the horrible, yeah. right? mindless, just mind-numbing boredom. All yeah. right, 
what is the way to be happy 75% of the time when your job absolutely sucks? And it doesn't just like suck, it's boring suck. Yeah, that's painful. That's painful boring. Um, it's interesting because, you know, when we say it's like going to bore me to death, um, research has found that that actually has some significant truth to it. Um, oh, like Fox News. Oh, <laughs> Not, not Fox <laughs> News. I don't know if Fox News featured it. But, I'm just kidding. Uh, I have no problem with Fox News. I think they even talked about my coffee once. Sorry, Fox. <laughs> anyway. um, yeah, I've, I've, I've also. Uh, um, no, but um, so this, it was a white, I believe it was the Whitehall study that asked people um, in the 80s, like, to what degree are you, have you been bored at your job in the past month? And then in 2001, um, they came back and they analyzed uh, the results. And what they found is that people who reported being bored at their jobs were three and a half times more likely to have died of a heart, of a heart problem. Um, I believe it was three and a half times or three times. So, so, so you can die of a broken heart or a bored heart. Or a, you can you can. It's because when we're not feeling stimulated or curious, you know, our brain begins to like really slow down. I mean, and and it's just sucks. You so, know, it, so Sudoku is the way to solve boredom. <laughs> I've actually never played Sudoku. I, I did it twice and was like, oh my god, that's so boring. <laughs> so it didn't work for me, but <laughs> but you know, I see people on the train doing it. Um, so, so you, you actually want to take your boredom seriously. Um, one thing that uh, you want to, if you're feeling really bored, the last thing you want to do is keep checking the clock. Um, because what happens when you're checking the clock is you're focusing on time and you're not focusing on what you're doing. And so if you can, um, so I'll, I'll bring up a little bit of, Chick Semihai, who is kind of the godfather um, who, of positive psychology, he also term, uh, coined the term flow. Um, Chick Semihai talks about true engagement, which is kind of the opposite end of boredom. True engagement is when we are kind of um, so lost in the tax, task at hand that we lose a sense of time, we lose a sense of space. Um, we even forget ourselves and kind of our ego rumination and what stuff means to you. Um, we also are challenging ourselves just enough um, so that it's we're out of our comfort zone. We, but you know we're we're getting challenged and we're getting feedback on our our performance. So um, so there's all these so there's these aspects that create a sense of engagement. So what I ask people to do is like, okay, well, how can you challenge yourself as you're, you know, pushing the carts or packing, you know, the boxes um, to be a little bit more um, engaged? How can you make a game out of that experience to improve your performance? Maybe you start to measure how fast each stage takes you and see if you can improve your speed. Or maybe at each stop, you really um, interact, you make it an effort to interact authentically with the person in the warehouse. Um, ask them how they're doing. Um, see how you can make their life a little bit easier. Um, so there's all sorts of micro ways that we can make anything into an engaging task, but it kind of it takes some work to really put yourself into it. But the last thing you want to do is just keep staring at the clock. You want to see how you can make what you're doing even better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, or it, quit. It, it, quitting is a great <laughs> one. Uh, for me, what I ended up doing was kind of two things. One was like, how can I do less of this? So I, I ended up like winning a, a pretty prestigious award for process improvement because I was so bored. I just yeah. had to find something to do. There you go. And, and I would like play 3D Tetris. So I'd pack the boxes so happy no one could move them. And then I'd laugh about it, which maybe wasn't so nice. <laughs> anyway, it, 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 was, it was not a fun experience, but it paid the bills, right? Yeah. But you, you did something about it. Yeah. You know, you, you did your best. All right. We're coming up on the end of the show. And there's yeah. a question I've asked everyone who's been on the show. 
And given everything you know, positive psychology or not, just your whole life experience, your top three recommendations for people who want to perform better. So if you want to kick ass in life, the three things that you should do according to Stella. Oh, my God. Okay, the three things you should do according to me. Oh, wow. Um, One is practice controlling your attention. Ooh, cool. So, again, kind of like you are the director of your own movie. So practice where you point the camera. Your attention is that camera. So when you're in a shitty situation um, or you want to perform even better, like how else can you look at a situation to come up with an even better idea or a more effective way of doing something um, or a deeper way of connecting with someone else? So that's one. Um, the next thing is I would really be aware of your well-being and how you can amplify your well-being because when you are feeling well, you're performing at 30 to 50 times with better. Um, so by your well-being, I'm talking about your positivity, your sense of engagement, your relationships, your sense of meaning, and your kind of level of accomplishment and mastery. And the third tip is not to take yourself too seriously. Um, I just wouldn't take yourself too seriously. I would just, you know, like it, things are always changing. And, um, and if you can just lighten up and have a little bit more fun and see things as more of a playful experience, um, then you're more likely to be, like you said, um, smooth and be able to be flexible um, in whatever situation comes up. Very, uh, very cool. And thank you for sharing those. It's it's always amazing to hear what different people, different paths uh, share. And I, I learn something every time. So much, much appreciate it. Yeah. Stella, thank you for being on the show. And please do tell people where they can learn more about you. I think you have a, a class you're teaching that's coming up. Tell us about that. Give us your URL, book titles, uh, other places that they can connect with you. Yes, um, absolutely. So um, I just posted a class. Um, if you're interested in learning about the science of happiness and and um, actually hack your happiness, um, I have a course on Udemy, which is the letter U D E M Y dot com slash science of happiness and I think we can um, share that with your your readers as well um, and it takes you through skills on how to hack you know your negative emotions and boredom and deepen those relationships and experience more meaning and make meaning out of struggle and um, experience higher levels of achievement and mastery so we talk about that, and it's all online. You can do it whenever, wherever. Um, and I love to offer your community 50% off if they'd like to start it now. I believe like the new year is the perfect time to kick this off um, because when you're more aware of your well-being, then you're more in control of how your, your, your life is going and how your performance is going. Well, that, that's a huge discount. Um, how, yeah. do, how do they get it? And by the way, guys, we don't have any affiliate thing or anything sort of like that. This is just a, you know, a generous offer. There's no, no underhanded business relationship here. So, so um, uh, thank you for that. And yeah. uh, tell people how they can get it. Um, so if you go on to udemy.com slash science of happiness, um, and I've, um, made a code just for you guys. It's um, bulletproof. That's the code, bulletproof. It's an easy to remember code. It's I like it. Easy to remember. Um, and if for any reason you cannot remember this information, you're driving, um, you can email me. I guess this is more information to remember Stella at whoopa.com. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, that's W O O. P A A H dot com. Stella, thanks a lot. Totally. Everyone, this episode was sponsored by the new Bulletproof 
upgraded truffle chocolate coffee beans. Actually, it wasn't sponsored, but we just launched them and I <laughs> ate like half a bag of these things and they're amazing and good and I'm totally buzzing this whole interview. You could tell I'm really happy. <laughs> so the trick to happiness for me was truffle chocolate <laughs> coffee beans made with all my ingredients. I'm jumping up and down. Anyway, um, Stella, much, much appreciated. Have an awesome evening. Thank you, you too. Uh, and were you actually putting raw liver in your smoothie though? Like just grinding it up? Absolutely. So, yeah. all right. I, you, still did that. I did that this morning. So you, not you, smoothie. I just power it down. You, you win the, the man award there. I, I cannot do a raw <laughs> liver smoothie. I, I've tried it there, but like, I think I actually put on a little bit more muscle mass you know, from the UK arm stuff. wrestling when I see you. That's I went? it. Oh, arm you'll, you'll take me down, yeah, JJ. I mean, <laughs> that's it. I, that's, I've issued a challenge. <laughs> The Eskimo, the Eskimo diet versus the virgin diet. Exactly.